Hello everyone, welcome to my videos on elementary differential equations. This is video number 7 for chapter 3. In this video, we will discuss the situation where the characteristic equation gives a complex root. So we will start with an example. In this example, we consider the equation which takes a simple form, that is y double prime plus y equals zero, and we want to find the general solution. Okay, let's do this by inspection. So if we rewrite this equation, moving the term y to the right hand side, we'll have y double prime equals negative y. This means we need to find a function such that if you differentiate it twice, you get negative times that function. So what functions that we are familiar with would have this property? So we know the exponential function, um, if you differentiate it each time, you get a constant in front of it. So it will not work because the second derivative will have the constant square times the function, which will never be a negative number. Then what about uh, um, trig functions? Let's say sine function. Okay, so once we open the door of the trig functions, then we see that um, cosine function and sine function they would both satisfy this equation because if you differentiate cosine you get negative sine and then you differentiate that again you get negative cosine and same thing happened to the sine function if you differentiate sine you get cosine and then differentiate again the second derivative becomes negative sine okay so which is negative of the function so this holds for both of them and then we need to verify they are linearly independent. That can be simply done by computing the Bronskian. And this was a exercise we had earlier, Bronskian of sine and cosine. You can easily repeat that. It's negative two, so it's never zero. So they are linearly independent. Therefore, we have found two functions, two solutions, y1 and y2 they are linearly independent therefore this can be used to form a set of uh, general solutions that is a linear combination of y1 and y2 so c1y1 plus c2y2 which gives us c1 cosine t plus c2 sine t okay so how um, does this discussion have anything to do with complex roots well, let's um, make that connection. Let's write out the characteristic equation for this. Then we'll get r squared plus 1 is 0, which we put here. And uh, moving the 1 to the other side, we get r squared is negative 1. To solve this equation, we see that we have two solutions. r1 is i, the imaginary number, and r2 is negative i. They both solve this equation. So we see that the roots are now complex numbers and in fact for this example these are pure imaginary numbers and we also know that for um, polynomials with real co number coefficients if you have a compact uh, root they come in pairs they are complex conjugate pairs. Okay, so this is actually plus minus i for the two roots. Okay, so at least that for this example, we will be tempted to conclude that if the roots are pure imaginary, or the imaginary part of the roots, they seem to give us sine and cosine functions. Okay, so just an observation. Okay, so let's have a little general discussion on the roots of the um, parabolic um, polynomial. So in general, 
this second order equation here will have this following characteristic equation, which is a second order um, polynomial, a parabolic polynomial in R. And now using the um, formula for the roots of this, which we remembered from high school, it takes this form. The two roots is negative b plus minus square root of this quantity, b square minus 4ac, and divided by 2a. And we see that um, in the case, what's under the square root, this b square minus 4ac shall be a negative number, strictly less than zero, then the roots are complex. Okay. And uh, in fact, we will get a pair of complex conjugate numbers as the roots. Okay, so let's now write the roots, the complex conjugate pair roots as uh, a lambda plus minus i times mu. Here, the lambda is the real part and the mu is the imaginary part of these roots. And then formally, um, just to use the discussion we had before, and then we will have the first solution is e to the r1 times t. We plug the complex number here, and let's separate the real part and the imaginary part. Then we can write this as a product. So it will be e to the lambda t, the real part, and then the imaginary part, e to the power i mu t. Okay, and then the second solution, y2, would be um, um, similar, um, but uh, we would put in um, the lambda 2 here with a minus sign, and then separate the real part and the imaginary part in the same way, we get the product e of lambda t and then e multiplied by e of negative i mu t. Okay, so now um, the, the real part of the function we are familiar with. It's an exponential function. If lambda is positive, then it's exponential growing. If lambda is negative, then it's an exponential decay. But the part with pure imaginary number on top of the exponential function is a new feature here. Okay, so to deal with that, we need to use the famous Euler's formula, which is the following. It deals with uh, an exponential function with pure imaginary power. So E to the i beta, where beta is a real number, i is the imaginary number. What does that equal to? Well, that is cosine beta plus i times sine beta. Okay, so this will help us dealing with uh, this function here. And then if you shall have a negative imaginary number, e to the negative i beta t, then it's the same. Then you just um, replace beta with negative beta. So cosine is an even function, you just get that. And sine negative beta, you can move the negative one in out. It's an odd function, so you get minus i sine beta. Okay, now we're going to utilize this Euler's formula to deal with these two, um, now they are functions and the imaginary part is in the power for the exponential function. Okay, so let's write out the um, exponential function with imaginary power into cosine and sine. So y1 would be, this the real part, and now the imaginary part is cosine mu t plus i times sine mu t directly applying Euler's formula. And then the second solution is the same, except I have a minus sign. Okay, and then both of them shall be solutions for the original equation. 
but uh, there are problems with this representation because we see that y1 and y2 are both complex numbers. So why is this a problem? Well, because usually these equations are coming from real-world problems that we formulated into a mathematical problem. And the solution usually are quantities of something, and they shall have real value. They're not complex number. So we would like to construct some real valued solution out of these two. So what do we do? Okay, so to achieve the goal of constructing real value solution, we use this powerful um, principle called the principle of superposition, which we have used over and over. So the superposition principle says that if you have two solutions, and for the homogeneous linear problem, then any linear combination of them is again a solution with any constant c1 and c2. Okay, so let's choose the constant c1 and c2 in a wise way, a smart way for our purpose. So the first example will be choosing c1, c2 both to be half. Namely, I add up these two and divide it by two then you see that the imaginary parts will cancel and the real parts are actually the same and then we'll just get the real part okay so um from my discussion we see that a half times y1 plus y2 now is exactly the real part of it is a solution so let's call this y1 tilde just to indicate it's different from y1 and then the second choice for the coefficient c1, c2 will be take a complex number, 1 over 2i for c1 and negative 1 over 2i for c2. And if you multiply both with that complex number, with the opposite sign, you see the real part cancels. And then you exactly get this imaginary part, they'll be added up to get a 2i and the 2i will be cancelled. Okay, So um, this one will give me exactly the um, imaginary part of this complex valued functions. So notice that y1 and y2, the, those two functions are um, complex conjugate of each other. Okay, so let's denote this one as y2 tilde. So we have two solutions, y1 tilde, y2 tilde. By the principle of superposition, we know they both are solutions. OK, so um, we found two solutions. Now, here remains the important question. Are they linearly independent? If they are, then we can use them to form the general solution. OK, so we need to make sure that. And that can be done by checking the Voromskian the Voromskian of y1 tilde and y2 tilde. You can um, just work out with the definition of the Voromskian, so um, I do not give details. If you want, you can pause the video and you work out the detail and you'll be convinced that this is the correct answer. Okay, and we see that um, this one is an exponential function and it's never zero. And therefore, we see that y1, y2 tilde, they are an linearly independent functions. So we can use them to form the general solution. So um, we'll have y is c1 times the y1 tilde plus c2 times the y2 tilde. And we can probably, if you want, the exponential of the real part is a common factor, you can take it out, then you will have c1 cosine mu t plus c2 sine mu t. Okay, so um, what we have observed here is that if the characteristics, okay, at least we derived, characteristics should have complex roots with the lambda to be real part and the mu to be imaginary part, then the general solution takes this form where and this term comes from the real part 
and then the cosine and sine together um, with c1 and c2 in front they come from the imaginary part well let's make a remark here so um we during our computation we probably have noticed that um, for an equation that has real value as coefficient and then you manage to find a complex valued function as a solution and then the real part and the imaginary part separately they are each a solution this is actually a general result let's do a quick um, proof for that because it's not difficult to show it let's see that yt is ut plus ivt let's say it's a complex value function and it's a solution for this uh, um, differential equation let's take a second order differential equation y double prime plus pty prime qty equals zero where p and q are real valued functions okay so and then um, the complex valued function yt we can differentiate which will be the sum of the uh, differentiation of the real and imaginary part and then the second derivative will be u double prime plus iv double prime so we can plug these in so this is y double prime and that's y prime and that's y and the equation should hold and then um, we see that in this equation we have real parts and we have imaginary part these are the imaginary parts we can collect them together and then we'll have this will be the real part that is u double prime and then pt times u prime and then qt times u which is here and the imaginary part we can put the i outside then we'll have v double prime p v prime here and q v equals zero so we see that this number equals zero okay it's a complex number equals zero you can view now the zero here as uh, a number in the complex plane that has zero real part and zero imaginary part okay so um, i added a term here you can think this is zero plus i times zero okay so what it means is that um, the real part here must be zero and the imaginary part here must be zero okay therefore we have this equation must hold and this equation must hold then this means u is a solution for the um, differential equation and as well as v so that proves that both u and v are solutions okay so even though um we proved this for a specific type of equation but uh, this actually holds for general linear um, differential equations okay so um okay so this video is a little bit theoretical and uh, next time we will use the knowledge here and apply this to um, concrete examples and see how we can use that to solve uh, more types of second order equations with the uh, different type of roots coming from the characteristic equation okay okay i um, hope you enjoyed this video and i look forward to seeing you next time